Make sure you say hi to the people around you and welcome them to the Beltline Church of Christ. <clears throat> Let me join in welcoming each and every one of you to the Beltline Church of Christ. Thankful that you are here today. It is a thrill, it is a privilege to see this room full of people ready to worship and praise the Lord. It is, an awesome, it is an awesome thing, and I'm thankful that you are here. Got to spend last week at the church in Gantier, Haiti. What an amazing experience that was to get to preach and to sing and to worship uh, with our brothers and sisters there. It was just awesome, just absolutely amazing. But I am glad to be home, uh, thankful to be here with you today and uh, continuing our series of lessons that we've entitled Flawed, Imperfect People, extraordinary lives. And I don't know if you're aware of this, but it was about a year ago, a little over a year ago now, when Frank Barker called and offered me the opportunity to be your preaching minister here at the Beltline Church of Christ. And Cindy and I, when, when, we, got the, uh, when we got the call, we, we, we did a lot of praying, we did a lot of talking, because from the very beginning of this whole process that was going on, our prayer was the same. We said, God, if that's not where you want us, and we don't even want a job or position to be offered at all. And I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but we were actually here in March of 2012. And after that initial interview and everything that came along, you know, the job wasn't offered. And so we, we continued on as if everything was, uh, was closed. The door was closed. Went back to work in Southern California, and, and that was fine, and that was good. And so I was surprised when Frank called and reopened that door and and offered us the position, and our prayer was always the same. If this is where you want us, and I want to tell you what my first reaction was after I got off the phone with Frank and said, okay, I'll do it, I was scared to death. <laughs> I was literally scared to death. What in the world is someone like me doing, preaching to such an amazing group of people? I was scared to death. Have you ever felt unqualified for something in your life? Ever been there? Ever just felt like you weren't the right guy for the job? I, I remember myself, I felt very unqualified walking into my first full-time preaching ministry in my hometown of Yuma, Arizona. That was, that was something. But, but then after that, I felt even more unqualified walking into the position in California. A master's degree and over 16 years now of full-time experience still has not prepared me. I, I still feel amazingly unqualified often. And I'm guessing that sometime or another in your life, you felt the same way. You felt that unqualified uneasiness. Maybe it was your first day at a new job, or maybe it was your first day at a new school. Maybe it was the day you brought home your first child from the hospital, and you're thinking, these people are not about to let me out of this hospital with this child and no instructions. I mean, this, I don't, I'm not qualified for this. And, and some of you know exactly what I'm talking about uh, right now. Maybe you were chosen to make a speech or to make a presentation and you questioned yourself the entire time. Why did they ask me to do this? And maybe, just maybe, there were others making it even harder for you because they were telling you in no uncertain terms, you are not qualified for this position. You are not the one that should be doing this. I think all of us have had those moments when we looked at what was ahead or we looked at what was needed in a certain situation and we thought, surely... I'm not the one that God would want to use right now. Not this time. Not me. Surely not this instance. We talked a little bit about Moses last week, and Scott did a great job bringing up the temper tantrums and the excuse-making of, uh, of that amazing man of, of Scripture. And, and what that tells me is this, that human beings in every period of history have felt this unqualified feeling. Whether it's the Bible, whether it's not the Bible, all of us at one time or another have felt that way in our lives. And so today, I want to talk about a guy that most would have thought was amazingly unqualified. His name is David. David has been a favorite for a lot of people for a variety of reasons, but mostly because I think all of us relate to David on, on some level or another. He was a real guy with real flaws, and he had a real heart for God, and he had a real heart for people. 
We know that David comes from very humble beginnings. He was literally a no-big-deal kind of guy who gets thrown into the limelight in 1 Samuel 16. In Acts chapter 13, we're told that he was a man after God's own heart. Acts 13, 22 lets us know that. He wasn't perfect, far from it. But in spite of all the messes that he made, God still wanted and still did use him to change his world. But long before David changed the world, long before he moved the nation in a new direction, and before he became Jesus' ancestor, he was a whole lot of nothing special. In fact, saying he was nothing special is probably an overstatement. And we read about David. He first enters the scene again in 1 Samuel chapter 16. So if you have your Bibles, let's be opening together there to 1 Samuel chapter 16. In ancient Israel... A few centuries before Jesus came on the scene, God's people started grumbling for a king. If you know your Bible history, you know this story well. Until that point, God had been their king. He had been the one that had led them. He had been the one that directed them. He had been the one that had guided them. He spoke. He worked. And and it all worked well except for one small detail. The children of Israel couldn't see God. And they wanted a king that they could see. They wanted a king that would make them like the nations around them. They wanted to be able to see him and touch him and feel him. And and he didn't want to just hear from him anymore. They didn't want to just know about him. They wanted to know him and see him. And, And so they grumble and they cry out for this king over and over and over again. God, through Samuel, tries to warn them that this is not really what you want. He tries to tell them an earthly king is going to mess everything up. But they kept rejecting God. And they kept asking for a king that they could see. And so God says, okay, I'll give you your king, but here's what it's going to be like. And God anoints for them a man named Saul. And here's what you need to know about Saul. He was, by earthly standards, the ultimate king. He looked more like a linebacker. I won't say Auburn or Alabama. Uh, He looked more like a linebacker for the Miami Dolphins than he did... (laughs) That wasn't funny. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> he looked more like a linebacker than he did a king. I mean, this guy was, was huge. He, he stood a head taller than everyone else in the land, the Bible tells us. He was big and he was strong and he happened to be a fierce warrior. And by outward appearances, I mean, this was the man. He was the man. And so Saul becomes Israel's first king. And for a while, at the very beginning, things are going along very well. It's, it's great. Things are, are going around great. The children of history, Israel are happy. Saul was happy. And everyone was winning, except one small detail. Saul starts getting weird. I think that's the best word I can say for it. He starts getting weird in his leadership style. God spoke to him, and one minute he's good with that. But in the next minute, he's doing his own thing. He's rejecting God's way. He's going his own direction. And this goes on for a while, and God isn't happy when we do that. And so eventually, God decides to go in a completely different direction. He decides his patience with Saul has run out, and so he lifts his hands of anointing off of Saul, and he decides to go in a whole new direction. He's going to choose a new leader for his people. And I think there's an important lesson for us in this today, church. If we want to keep walking away from God, if we want to keep rejecting his leadership in our lives, God will honor our choice. Just like the children of Israel, God will honor our choice if we want to do that. But he's going to rise up what he wants to have accomplished through someone else if you refuse to do what God wants you to do. As I look at the times of the kings, it seems to me that they're very similar to our own times. They're very similar to what's going on in our own world. You see, you don't have to look far to find leader after leader after leader who's gone a little bit weird, a little bit crazy in their leadership styles. From politicians having affairs to corporate executives embezzling and cheating loyal employees out of millions of dollars. The world in which we live has chosen its own way over God's way and consequently has lost its way. And that's sad, but it gets worse because the body of Christ is no exception. Not a month goes by that we don't read of yet another leader in the body of Christ who has decided to choose his own way over God's best way. Scandals, affairs, embezzlement, those are terms used to describe far too many church leaders and church leaders' actions today. 
And just as God stepped in with Israel all those years ago, I am convinced of something today. I am convinced that God is stepping in once again, and he wants to change the course that our world is going. And he's looking for a few men and a few women to be willing to be a part of what he's doing. And the most important part that I want you to get from this lesson today is simply this. Put this on the board. I don't want you to miss this. Here's the point that I want you to get from the lesson today. You have permission today. You have permission today to believe that you are the one that God wants to use in a really big way. You have permission today to believe that God wants to use you. And I know what you're thinking. Sure, Steve, I believe that on some level that God wants to use me. But, but certainly, surely, it's probably not me. And if that's what you're thinking right now, I understand. It's easy to dismiss the possibility that God might actually want to be using me. It's easy to dismiss that, to, to set it aside, uh, that, that God might actually want me to be someone who leads the changing of our world. It's easy to see ourselves as unqualified. But my question is, why not you? Why shouldn't it be us? Why shouldn't it be you? Why shouldn't it be me? So by the authority of Jesus Christ, not by my authority, by his authority, I am giving you permission today to believe that you are the one God wants to use in a major way for his kingdom purposes today. You have permission to believe that. Go with me. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 1. Listen to what the text says to us. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fear your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. And Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, do you come peaceably? And he said, peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. You see, Samuel was waiting to do what God had already told him to do because what God was asking him to do was something that was pretty hard. It was something that was pretty difficult. In fact, it was something that was pretty dangerous. I mean, if the king finds out that you're anointing another king, that could cost you your life. And Saul, Samuel's just kind of waiting on that. He says, I don't know that I want to do this. And, and God says, what are you waiting for? You have your marching orders. Get up and go get it done. And the point for us is this. If we wait, hear this now. If we wait until everything is safe, if we wait until everything is easy, if we wait until every possible duck is in every possible row, we're going to miss what God is doing right in front of us. If we wait until it's safe, if we wait until it's easy, we're going to miss what God is doing right in front of us. He's calling us to step out. He's calling us to be his hands and his feet to this world. He's calling us to make a difference right here where we are right now. But some of us, we have this whole safety thing backwards. We're so afraid of not being safe that we, 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 we build our nice little safe lives and we forget that God hasn't called us necessarily to that. Now, should we take risk and put ourselves in, in unholy positions? Of course not. But, but we should be stepping out for the Lord. In verse 6, it goes on. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God stops Samuel dead in his tracks. He says, not this time, Samuel. Not this time. That's not how I operate. That's not how I, how I want it to be done. He says, Samuel, it's not all about appearances. Yeah, Saul looked the part and he got the part, but that's not how I roll. That's not how I operate. That's not how everything goes. It's not all about appearances. And what I want to say to you today is stop assuming that you know what it's supposed to look like. God may be calling someone that you could least expect to be his man, to be his woman. 
And, and that person may be you, but you're saying it couldn't be me. It couldn't possibly be me because I don't look right. I don't have the right part. I'm not moving. In, whatever. Stop that. Listen, this is, this is God speaking to us. He says, I don't look at outward appearances. I look at the heart. He stopped Samuel dead in his tracks. In verse 8, then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by. And he said, neither has the Lord chosen this way. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. Can you imagine being there? <laughs> Put yourself in the audience watching this thing unfold uh, to think about it for a minute. Imagine being there. You're sitting, watching the whole thing play out, and the first son, Eliab, passes by. And here you are sitting, and you're thinking, oh, I just love Eliab. He's such a good young man. He'll make a fantastic king. I mean, I mean <laughs> and, then, and then the Lord rejects him, and you're like, ooh, <laughs> That's kind of that's harsh, but there's a whole row of sons to choose from, so it's going to be it's going to be okay. Can you imagine being one of the one of the brothers as this is taking place? Eliab gets paraded in front of Samuel, and you're the youngest, and you look and say, "Man, it's not fair. Eliab always gets to do all the fun stuff." <laughs> being a younger son, I know what that is all about. He always gets it. He always gets to do all the fun stuff. And then he gets rejected, and you deep down are like, yeah, how you feel now? How you like that, Eliab? <laughs> I had two older brothers growing up. I can appreciate that. But imagine, imagine being Samuel here. Not only do you have to let half a dozen brothers down easy, but then after all the sons have paraded by, Samuel has to ask the most awkward question ever. Is this it? Is this all you got? Verse 11. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. Jesse actually admits, this is what drives me crazy about the story, to leaving out one of his children. Well, you know, Samuel, I actually do have one child left, but he's the runt of the family. He's out in the fields, and, and I just didn't think he was worth bringing in to this celebration. <laughs> Can you imagine? He, he, he has a son that he didn't invite to this amazing ceremony, and the award for worst father of the year goes to Jesse the Bethlehemite. I, I mean, come on, Dad, what are you doing here? You, you're going to leave a son out of this amazing process? Actually, I did forget one, Jesse says. Little Davy, he's out, he's out in the field. He's the runt of the family. And so we left him in the field with the sheep. Listen, this wasn't an accident. Jesse purposely left David out of the equation. Jesse doesn't think that David could be part of the solution. Jesse didn't think that David mattered. Now, I have no doubt that Jesse loved his son. I have no doubt about that at all. But Jesse is saying loud and clear, David, you are not qualified for this. You are not qualified for this position. Surely God couldn't use or want to use an unqualified afterthought like David. David's own father didn't even see, didn't even believe in his potential. And my guess is that there are some of you here today that know exactly how that feels. You know how it feels to not have your father believe in you or even remotely be there for you. You know exactly the pain that David must have felt in this moment. For others of you, maybe it's not a father, maybe it's a mother. Maybe it was a boss, or a coach, or maybe it's a friend, or maybe it's a brother or a sister. Maybe it's been that own voice in your own head telling you that you're not qualified, you're not enough. And perhaps it's that unbelief that has become an excuse for you, an excuse that holds you back from doing what you know God wants you to do. If that's you, you need to know today that you are no different than King David. The same King David whose father didn't think enough of him to invite him to the anointing ceremony. And I want you to know something right here and right now. Please don't miss this. Here, here's the point. God knows who you are. Do you believe that today? God knows who you are. He knows where you are. He knows when you are. You are not a mistake. 
You need to know that today. You need to understand and embrace that truth because no matter what anybody else in your world has said to you, God knows who you are. He knows where you are. He knows when you are. You are not a mistake by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, I believe today that you have been chosen by God to break the curse of unbelief that has been put on your life today. You have been chosen to break the curse. And once again, in the name of Jesus Christ, you have permission to break the lie, to break the curse, and to begin brand new, anew, right now, today. And so at the very end of verse 11, Samuel says this. He says, Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him. Listen now. If you underline in your Bible, this is something to underline. For we will not sit down until he comes here. Interesting. Samuel, as soon as he learns of David and knows that there are no other sons, Samuel begins to treat David as royalty. Do you get that? Everyone stood in the room until David got there. Samuel is communicating to this crowd that they were about to be in the presence of royalty. Now take a look at that response to David and his own father's response. Pretty different, isn't it? One saw his potential, the other did not. But it was the one that saw that potential. It was that belief that made all the difference. I don't know what voices have spoken over you in your past. My guess is they're not all positive. But I pray that God today will start to break the power of those voices in your life that you'll begin to hear his voice louder than you'll hear the voice of the accuser, that you'll begin to listen for his voice, and you'll learn that voice, and you'll know that voice, and you'll hear that voice a lot louder than you'll hear any other voice that's speaking in any room that you walk into. Verse 12, and he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and he had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord, listen to this, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. And Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. God chose David to be the one to lead and nobody saw this one coming. Nobody saw it coming. No one would have guessed that in a million years that David was the one. He was a shepherd boy. He was a nobody. He wasn't famous. He wasn't even raised in the right family. He didn't even come in the right birth order. Everything that could have been wrong about David was wrong about David except for one thing. God chose him. And that's enough. That's enough. And so this is important for us to hear today as well. Maybe you've looked at yourself and thought, I'm not good enough. I'm not qualified enough. Maybe you've always told yourself, well, I'm not as pretty as my sister. or I didn't go to the right school. Or maybe my parents weren't all that proud of me. If that's you, then hear this. All the wrong stuff in the world plus God's hand of anointing equals the right person. You are the right person for the job. You are the right person person to do what God wants you to do. Remember, you have permission to believe that today. You have permission to believe that you are the one God wants to use in mighty ways for his kingdom purposes today. You, sitting here today, December 15th, 2013, you are the one that God wants to use. And it's time for you today to rise up and make that dream that God has placed on your heart happen. There is a world full of hurting broken and desperate people out there and we have the answers that they need we have the answers that they need they are searching for what we have to offer and God is calling us to rise up to the challenge to to rise up with the message of hope that Jesus has for this world that we live in for the city that we live in for the community that I reside in far from perfect David honored God. He lived courageously, and he led the nation of Israel back to God, and his great-great-great-grandson would come after him, Jesus Christ, and he would change the world forever. Now, David could have let his excuses stop him from being God's man. He could have said, I'm the runt of the family. I'm not qualified. He didn't do that. He overcame all the voices of doubt that had been placed on his life for his entire life. 
Saul didn't get the job done, and so God called someone else. And the same goes for you today. Today you are receiving your calling to be a nobody that God can use to impact this world that we live in. You have permission to believe today that that's you. You are the one that God is waiting to use to make a difference in the world that you live in. God wants to set you free. He wants to set you free from past condemnation. He wants to set you free from past words spoken over you. He wants to set you free from past sin. God wants to set you free to rise up and change the world. Hear this now. God is ready to give you the courage that you need to be the leader he wants you to be. I want you to believe today that just as he did with David, God has placed his hand on you, and he's chosen you to be his man. He's chosen you to be his woman to impact this world. The only question that we have left to answer is what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with that? Are you going to rise to the occasion or are you going to stay the course? Are you going to let God use you Or are you going to keep trying to do it your own way? Oh, guys, y'all, let God have his way with you. He is an awesome God who is mighty to save. And that salvation is available to you. And if you have the courage to step out for him, that salvation is available for those that you know, that those that you come in contact with every day. If you need that salvation, you're in the right place. Not that we have any power in of ourselves, but we can point you to the one who has it all, and that's Jesus Christ. And if we can help you, we hope that you'll come right now. While together we stand and we sing this song for your encouragement. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. 